this unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who, is al who also will do it. Well, I want to welcome Paul Volk here to our uh, church service today. Where do you live? Paradise, California. Paradise, California. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's interesting. I'm from heaven. I'm glad to see that you are in a good place, too. Okay. So anyway, um, we live on a road called High Heaven. Oh, okay. okay. So anyway, we're glad to have you here today worshiping in our church service, and we'll Thank enjoy you. the message you have for us. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be back here in Oregon. It's been a while since I've been here. I um, always like the Northwest. A world famous theologian was about to retire from the seminary where he taught for many years. Pastors, evangelists, students from all over the world gathered together to bid a fond farewell to this much beloved professor. Banqueting hall was packed, and as he approached the rostrum, notepads were taken out, tape recorders were readied, and he said these words, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And he sat down. That was it, his farewell address. I like that. Say it with me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Do you believe that? Yes. Oh, I'm not convinced. Do you believe that? Yes. Oh, that's better. This morning I'm going to share with you God's testimony because this sermon really is all about God and what he did for a man like me. To give you a little bit of my background, my father is a Roman Catholic. My mother was a Methodist Sunday school teacher. My brother is an elder in the Mormon church, and I went to Baptist Bible school. So I had a lot of churchianity as I was growing up, but I really didn't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now you and I have two critical needs in this lifetime, and depending upon how well and how often these two needs are met, it will determine our quality of life while we're here on this earth. Those two needs are first, to receive love, and second, to give love. And it is through Jesus Christ that we receive more love than we ever thought existed, and then because of that, we become capable of giving more love than we ever thought possible. That's good news. Now, the Lord knocks at the door of our heart many times. Have you noticed that? He brings people into your life. He puts you into situations to draw you closer to him. And I know he did that to me several times. One incident I remember in particular, I was heading for college from Alaska, where I grew up, to Washington State. Back in the 60s, they didn't have assigned seating on the jet. And when you got on the plane, you could sit wherever you wanted. So I would always wait to be one of the last to get on the plane, because when I would get on, I would look for a young lady sitting by herself. And that evening I got on the plane and to the back next to the window, there was a young lady sitting by herself. So I followed back and I asked her if anybody was sitting next to her and she said no. And I said, do you mind if I join you on this flight? And she said, of course, go ahead, sit down. And so we began our three and a half hour flight from Anchorage to Seattle. The plane barely got into the air and she started sharing with me about her love for God. And I thought, oh great, I have a Jesus freak. Three and a half hours. Well, that's okay. But as we began to land into Seattle, she said, Paul, there's a couple of things I need to share with you before we part company, because I may never see you again. And I said, okay. First of all, I am scared to death to witness, but I made God a promise that if he would bring somebody directly into my path, I would share my faith. And when I got on this jet this evening, I sat down beside this window, bowed my head and prayed, Father in heaven, if there's somebody on this flight this evening 
that needs to know the saving blood of Jesus and the power of the cross at Calvary. And before I finished that prayer, a voice interrupted. I looked up, and it was you. So you and I have a divine appointment this evening. I said, okay. She said, secondly, I believe one day you're going to become a Christian. And I said, I know you all say that. It's part of your little brainwashing trick. We're going to get you. You're going to be one of us. She said, no, I can tell by the goals that you have, the excitement that you have, the only way you will fulfill these is when you become a Christian. I said, okay. And Paul, the day you become a Christian, you're going to have one regret. I said, one? I could tell you a dozen right now. I can't go here. I can't smoke this. I can't drink this. I can't do that. She said, no, no, no. There's only one thing you're going to regret. And I said, well, lay it on me. I'll tell if you're right or wrong. Paul, the one thing that you're going to regret when you finally become a Christian is that you didn't do it sooner. And you know she was absolutely right. The only thing I ever regretted was I wasted the first 23 years of my life destroying not only myself, but everyone around me. You see, I was involved in a very pathetic little game. Some of you may know this game. Some of you may have played it. I call it the love me game. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Paul, and I want to have lots of friends. So I'll smoke what you smoke. I'll drink what you drink. I'll eat what you eat. Just love me. Be my friend. I want to have lots of friends. I'll wear what you wear. I'll listen to what you listen to. I'll watch what you watch. Just love me. Be my friend. I want to have lots of friends. I got pretty good at the game. I had a lot of so-called friends. But this game nearly cost me my life. And I'm going to share that with you right now. I was living in Tucson, Arizona at the time. My roommate had gotten some marijuana in from Mexico, just over the border. Now, I want to say at the beginning of this story that I'm ashamed of the things I did my BC days before Christ, but I share this one incident because it was a critical turning point. Unbeknown to me, the marijuana was laced with angel dust. And believe me, it was a fallen angel who did that. It's also known as PCP. It's actually an elephant tranquilizer, and it can tranquilize humans to a dead stop. After a couple of hits of this marijuana, my system started to go crazy. I got scared. I left the party, went back into my bedroom, and pulled open the bottom drawer because I remembered what I'd shoved down in that bottom drawer out of sight was a Bible. I took that Bible out. I laid across the bed, the Bible against my chest. I knew I was dying. My system was shutting down. And as my eyes got heavier and heavier, I had one last thought, one last prayer. God, if you're real, if there really is a God, if there really is a heaven, then let me live to see the morning sun. But if there's no God, no angels, no heaven, all this is a fairy tale, then I'll just die tonight and it won't make any difference. But if by chance you're real and you let me live to see that morning sun, I promise to find you. Amen. My eyes got heavier and heavier and they finally closed, but it was for me the very last time. I was unconscious for hours, and then I awoke. I still had this Bible clenched to my chest. And brothers and sisters, I believe the power that this book represents is why I'm able to stand before you today. God intervened. As I began to gather my thoughts, I remembered that prayer. God, if you're real, let me live to see the morning sun. I reached behind me where the curtains were above the bed, and I pulled them open, and sunlight shot across the room, and the glory of God filled that whole room. I began to laugh and cry at the same time. God, you're real. You've let me live to see the morning sun. There really is a heaven. There really are angels, and now I'm going to find you. But I didn't know how. And so I walked out into the living room, and I opened up the yellow pages under churches. There was no listing for God. Every Sunday, I went to a different church, right out of the telephone book. I would sit in the back and I would listen, 10 minutes, 20, maybe 30, but I knew God wasn't there. I knew what it was like when he came into my room, and that's what I was waiting for, his presence. And I would get up and I would walk out. Next Sunday, right through the phone book, alphabetically. Now, when you go through the Tucson phone book, <laughs> through churches, you've got about eight pages but I was prepared to go to Zion Lutheran Church if I had to, to find that God who came into my room that morning. Well, it can take you a while to get down to the S's, if you know what I'm talking about. But God had a shortcut in mind. 
After several months of going to the alphabet in the phone book, I came home to the swinging singles pig pen where I lived. You know, that's where prodigal sons go. I was a life insurance agent at the time. I had much more money than a young man my age should have had. I had a 65 Mustang. I lived in a very plush condominium with sand volleyball courts, jacuzzi, saunas, whirlpool, entertainment centers, wine and cheese parties, you name it. Everything bad boys like. That fall, I was supposed to go back to Atlantic City with my aunt. My aunt was one of the directors for the Miss America pageant. She knew all the people at 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, MGM, and she said, when you get into your 20s, I'm gonna take you with me, but not till then. And at 23, she said, now's the time. You're coming with me to Atlantic City, and you're going to be a star. God knew that, he saw that, and he knew this had to stop, or I may never make it out. One day I came home to the condominium, and I stepped inside the center courtyard where all the toys were, and I noticed there was a brochure on everybody's door except mine. And so I went to the neighbor, and I stole his brochure. <laughs> and I opened it up to see what it was talking about, because I didn't want to miss anything. And it was on Bible topics. And I said, oh, I wonder what church this is. Now, this was a four-color run brochure. So this wasn't the corner church Xeroxing them off. This was a chain. This is part of a franchise that's all established. And so I tried to find what they were, and I couldn't see it. So I called them up on the phone. I said, what denomination are you? And she said, oh, we're just a God-fearing church. And I said, well, of course, you all say that. Look, I'm checking you out. You're not checking me out. I want to know what denomination you are. Why don't you just come one night to the crusade? If you don't like it, you never have to come back again. Are you Jehovah's Witnesses? No, I'll come. <laughs> and so I went to the crusade, and I sat in the back, fully expecting to get up and walk out in 20 or 30 minutes. But for the first time, this evangelist was opening up the Bible, and he was allowing the Bible to explain itself. Everywhere he went, Old Testament, New Testament, he was letting the Bible explain itself. This was good. Okay. 10 minutes went by, 20, 30, an hour, two hours. I was back the next night, and the next night, and the next night. The beginning of a five-week crusade. By the third week, I was halfway up the front. This was good. I never saw anything like this. So clear, so solid, right out of the Bible. And on that fifth and final week, I was right here on the front row, paper and pen flying everywhere. I couldn't believe what I was learning. This was great. But on that final week, he brought up a topic I could not accept. He was wrong, I had proof, and I was angry with God. Why did you lead me to four and a half weeks of clear, solid truth, and on the fifth week, you blow it? He was wrong, and I had proof. And for you to understand why I could not accept him, I have to take you back a couple of years to my senior year in high school. I went to a high school of about 900 students, Beginning of every school year, all of us guys were walking around on our tiptoes looking over the new crop of girls that showed up over the summertime. And by the way, my PowerPoint isn't up. PowerPoint? No PowerPoint? Oh. <laughs> there we go. No. There. <laughs> all right, I'll take it from here. <laughs> Beginning of every school year, as guys were walking around, looking over the new crop of girls that showed up, and I remember I was heading up the north hallway, and a young lady was walking toward me. Long brown hair, bright blue eyes, a spring in her step, and a sparkle on her face. And as soon as she passed, I followed. <laughs> I wrote down her room number, I ran back to my class at the end of the period, I ran back where she was, I followed her to the next class, I wrote down that room number, and I was trying to see who she was talking to because she was the new girl and I didn't know who she was. So I kept asking around, and people said, was it her, is her? No, no, it's not her. And my friend Carrie says, I think I know who you're talking about. Is it that girl? And I said, yes, introduce us. So she introduced us. Chris McDaniel. Wow, I was so happy. <laughs> now she knows my name. So I used to run around the school to make sure I was heading in the opposite direction that I knew she had to go to go to her next class. And I'd be walking down the hall real cool. I'd say, hi, Chris. She'd say, hi, Paul, and my heart would pound. <laughs> Woo, she knows my name. Well, a few weeks went by. Now, I'm a very shy person by nature. <laughs> I am. And God gives me holy boldness when I'm in his business. But other than that, I'm a very shy person. And you'll hear more about that in the seminar. 
Well, I built up my courage after several weeks, and I asked her out for a date. And she said, no. I said, that's okay. She knows my name. A few more weeks went by. I built up my courage again, and I asked her out a second time. And she said, you know the feeling. <laughs> few more weeks went by. I couldn't help myself. I asked her out a third time, and she said, no. <laughs> Strike three. You're out. But a few days later, the girl who introduced us said, hey, I hear you've been asking that Chris McDaniel girl out. I said, oh, man, don't tell anybody. I'm so embarrassed I got the picture. She doesn't want to go out with me. You know what you're doing wrong? What do you mean? Well, you keep asking her for that coming weekend. And I said, well, yeah. This girl is booked. Every guy on campus is asking her out. She's new from California. I said, really? Yes, you need to ask her out something farther ahead where she still has an opening. And I says, no, I can't ask her out again. That's too embarrassing. Ask her out one more time, but farther ahead. Are you sure? We girls talk. <laughs> so I ran home and I pulled out my calendar. I picked something one month away, November 11. Next day I go to school and I saw Chris and I said, hey, Chris, there's this big event going on over at West High on November 11th. And I thought maybe if you weren't busy, we can go out. And she said, Yes! I got a hold of Mickey and Sheila, and I said, you got a double date with us. The four of us got to go out, because I don't want all the talking. I don't know what to talk about. And there's four of us. I don't have to do all the talking. You can do some of the talking also. And I said, calm down, Paul. Calm down. Four of us will go. We'll double date on that first date. I was so excited. I had one month to iron my socks, to grow my pimples, to get ready for that big event. Day arrives, November 11th. All-day event. Halfway through the day, we go to a restaurant to get something to eat. And as soon as I pulled into the parking lot and stopped the car, Mickey and Sheila jumped out of the car and they raced. Who can get to the restaurant first? And so as I saw what they were doing, I jumped out of the car and I started running, trying to catch up to them. And I looked back and Chris was still coming. So I said, come on, Chris, hurry up. And she started running as fast as she could. I held out my hand. She slipped her little hand into mine and my feet did not touch the ground the rest of the day. It was my senior year. She was two years behind me as a sophomore. And yes, we did go to the prom together. Well, graduation time, we decided we would keep a long distance relationship. I was gonna go away to college. She was going to be a junior and she said, you know, next year I'm a junior. Uh, do you mind if I try out for cheerleading? Well, sure, why not? Well, some guys don't want their girlfriends to be cheerleaders because they're jealous or insecure, possessive. I said, no, no, go ahead, try out. I mean, really, what were her chances? 900 students, we only have six varsity cheerleaders. So she tried out and she made the squad. She became one of our six varsity cheerleaders. Well, I was happy for her. I went off to college, came back at Christmas. We spent the holidays together. I'd go back to college, come back for the summer, we spend the summer together. She was now a senior and she was preparing for her graduation. She'd already been accepted full scholarship at a private university, very intelligent. And she said, uh, is it okay if I, I can try out for cheerleading again this year? I said, sure, go ahead. Well, this time she not only made the squad, she became the captain, our head varsity cheerleader. And every year we would always send our head cheerleader to a camp in California where thousands of cheerleaders come in from all over the country to order their new uniforms and to learn their flips and their jumps and their yells. And, so she was our captain, she went to camp and there she was learning everything. I was off to college, came home at Christmas time, spent the holidays again, and I remember we were walking down the hallway and we passed by the big trophy case. And there were all the banners and the awards and so on. And, and I looked inside and there was a gold baton laying sideways and her name was engraved on it. And I said, Chris, wh what's your name doing on this baton? And she looked and she goes, oh, that's nothing. Come on, let's go. And I said, wait a minute, how come your name is on this? What's this about? She goes, really, it's not anything. Come on, let's go. So I grabbed one of the other students and I said, how come Chris's name is on this baton? And they said, well, didn't you know she went to cheerleading camp? And I said, yeah, she's our head cheerleader. Well, it was at that camp she was voted the most outstanding cheerleader in the United States. She never told me this because she is a very humble girl and a very kind girl. And she said, you know, we all had fun at the camp. They were just really nice to me. Come on, let's go. Well, I flew back to college and I realized 
this was the girl that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, that I wanted her to be the mother of my children. And in fact, I had the name of the first two already picked out. <laughs> if it was a boy, it would be Christopher Michael. Uh, if it was a girl, it would be Christine Michelle. The next boy would be named Robert James, and she could name all of the rest. <laughs> Well, it was now the first week in March. I was preparing for some final exams, and a phone rang early in the morning. I answered, it was a friend back up in Alaska, and I said, uh, hi, how are you guys doing? And she says, uh, I'm doing fine. She goes, listen, has anybody from up here called you in the last 24 hours? And I said, well, no, I was just home for Christmas, so nobody's called. Then you didn't hear about the accident. And I said, was anybody hurt? And she began to cry. And I said, Chris is all right, isn't she? And she began to sob. And she said, there was a wrestling tournament last night. Three of our cheerleaders rode home with one of the wrestlers. And I said, is she in the hospital? Is she in the hospital? What are they doing for her? There was a drunk driver and a head-on collision. And I said, Chris was not in that car, was she? Just tell me she was not in that car. Gloria and Cheryl died last night. And I'm sorry to tell you, Chris is also dead. And I said, you've got to get her to the hospital. You've got to call all the doctors. You can't give up on her. Please, don't let her die. Don't let her die. I'll never get to hold little Christine in my arms. I'll never get to watch my Robbie boy grow up. Because one young person decided they could drink and drive. And three girls never got to graduate. Three girls never got to have their family because one young person wanted to drink and drive. And now you know one of the reasons why I go into the high schools and talk to the kids about drugs and alcohol because if I can spare somebody else going through what I had to, these girls would have not died in vain. I dropped out of college. I flew home to the funeral of the three girls after the funerals were over, my parents asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, nothing. I have no more tomorrow. I have no more future. I've dropped out of college. There's nothing for me. So they gave me the credit cards and said, you just go where you need to go and do whatever you need to do. I flew down to Arizona to stay with some friends there. I was there for about two weeks. And I was suddenly awakened in the middle of the night. There was a pink swirling light that filled my room. Now Chris's casket was a pink crushed velvet casket. That same pink color was now swirling around my room. And I sat up in bed and I thought maybe it was a car backing up, you know, the red tail lights. There was nothing out there. This light was inside my room. And then over in the corner, a round white ball of light suddenly appeared. And this time I rubbed my eyes to look again. And this small white ball of light began to slowly move to the very center of the room. And as it did, it got larger and larger and larger. And when it stopped, a silver light began to shimmer up and down and it began to take shape. And suddenly, there stood my little cheerleader. I was so happy. I distinctly remember walking across that cold floor in my bare feet. I put my arms around her waist. She put her arms around my neck. She kissed me here, and she said, please, don't cry anymore. I'm all right. All three cheerleaders made numerous visits to family and friends with the same message. We died so suddenly in the accident. God gave us special permission to come back to Earth to say goodbye to our loved ones. And now, three years later, I'm sitting on the front row of this crusade, and this evangelist is trying to tell me the dead know not anything. And I said, preacher, you know not anything. I have proof, and so do a lot of other people. So I had a decision to make, a struggle. Do I take the Bible or my own experience? Satan well knew that if I took my experience, he had me. I would have no book to guide me through life. 
And so I prayed, I continued to study, and I realized that that was not Chris who came to visit me. That was a demon, or Satan himself. I know she's asleep. In fact, she was supposed to have gotten baptized on the end of March. She started taking Bible studies, but on March 6th, she took her rest in Jesus. And I'm looking forward to that resurrection morning when she's going to come up out of that grave. And just like on our first date, I'm going to hold out my hand and she's going to slip that little hand into mine and our feet won't touch the ground. I know many of you are looking forward to that resurrection morning to see family and loved ones again, as I am, like that little child we heard about today. We're looking forward to that. Now, a number of years ago, um, I attended all of her high school reunions because I knew all the kids. I went to the 10, 20, 30, 40. At her 30-year reunion, the director, Gwen, said, Paul, we're going to do something different this year we've never done before for the reunion. And I said, what's that? We're going to go visit the graves of all three cheerleaders. And I said, that'll be wonderful. And she said, we want you to speak on behalf of Chris. I said, I don't know if I can do that. And she said, yes, you can. Some of our classmates still aren't saved, and we need to give them the gospel message. I want you to do that. So I prayed about it, and it was just so amazing. I mean, here we are, 30 years later, her classmates standing around her grave. And I told them, she's asleep right now, but you know she's looking forward not to the 20-year reunion, the 30, the 40, the 50. She's looking forward to that reunion that every single one of you will be there in the kingdom of heaven. And there's nothing Chris and I would want more than to have that great reunion for the class of 1970 of East Anchorage High School to be in full attendance at that. So I had the opportunity to still speak for her, even though she's resting in Jesus. And I know that reunion day is going to be amazing and wonderful. Well, as a new... Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I received the most important document that I possess. Of all the awards and recognitions I've received from man, this is the most important document of my life, my baptismal certificate. I believe a copy of this was placed at the throne of God by my guardian angel on my baptismal day. On the back of this are 13 vows, 13 promises that I made to God. And by the power of his Holy Spirit, he's continuing to work these out every day of my life. Now, I haven't arrived, but I'm on my way. I'll get back to this a little later. Well, as a new Seventh-day Adventist Christian, my family had a lot of questions. Why another church in our house? And why Seventh-day Adventist? It's a good question. It's a fair question. One that I might ask some of you this morning. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I have two reasons. Number one, it has given me the clearest picture of God according to the scripture that I've ever seen. If you have a clearer picture of God according to the Bible, you have my undivided attention. I want to know God. The second reason why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is because it has brought the power of the Holy Spirit into my life to be the Christian man that God wants me to be. If you can help me have more of this Holy Spirit in my life, I'm listening. I want to be God's man in these last days. Well, I said, Lord, this message looks pretty good. It looks pretty solid, but I really don't know these people very well, and maybe they do something weird once in a while. I found out you did, but that was beside the point. <laughs> I said, Lord, I read that Gideon gave you a test just to confirm things for him, so it's my turn. I'm going to give you a test. Before I run around and start telling everybody, and find out it was a mistake, I'm going to test you on this. And here's the test. I'm going to share this with four people. Now, obviously, God put on my heart which four to do, and it was my grandparents and two sisters I grew up with, Carrie and Kelly. It wasn't my mother, it wasn't my brother, nobody else, just my grandparents 
And these two sisters, obviously God knew their hearts and he knew that it was time. I said, I'm gonna share this with these four. If this is not the truth, if this is not a clear picture of you, don't let them accept it. And I'll keep searching because I'm not looking for a church. I'm looking for a relationship with God. A church will never save you. You know that, don't you? So I said, if this is true, I want them to all be baptized within one year. You know what happened within one year, don't you? All four were baptized. And I said, wow, Lord, that's pretty good, four out of four. But uh, I did notice Gideon tested you twice. So I want one more. And I promise no more after that one. And here's the second test. I want you to send to me somebody from another church, another denomination, and tell me that I know Jesus as a Seventh-day Adventist. Would you do that? Well, he did it several times, but I'm just going to share this one. I was up in Anchorage working at Nordstrom for the Christmas rush. It pays very well. You get a percent of what you sell. So I was working for Nordstrom for the Christmas rush, and uh, I was no longer a cigarette smoker. I was a brand new Adventist, just a little over a year old. And so I really didn't like cigarette smoke. So whenever a customer would come in puffing away, it was back when you could smoke in the stores, I would ask them to put on the ashtray while I waited on them. And then I'd slide the ashtray down the counter and then I'd come back and I'd wait on them. Well, this lady came in puffing away and I said, would you mind putting your cigarette on the ashtray while I waited on you? And she says, no. As soon as she did, I dutifully slid the ashtray and the cigarette far away. I'd come back and she said, cigarette smoke must bother you. I said, yes, I understand it'll kill you. She laughed. She says, I take it you don't smoke. And I says, no, but I used to do a lot of silly things. I used to smoke cigarettes. I used to eat dead animals. I used to take drugs. I used to stay up all night at nightclubs. But my whole life has changed. She said, really? I said, yep, I don't drink anything that bubbles. I said, I don't eat anything that moves or crosses anywhere. I said, my, I get to bed at midnight, which for me was good back then. God takes us a step at a time, doesn't he? Yes. So midnight, that was early. So... She said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? No, go ahead. She said, uh, are, uh, are you a Christian? I said, am I a Christian? Yes, I'm a born-again, baptized Seventh-day Adventist. I'm only 13 months old in my walk with God, but life has become so exciting for me. I love going to Wednesday night prayer meeting, Friday night Vespers, church all day on Saturday. I'm understanding God's will for my life. The Bible has come alive to me. And I told her about my background, that my father was a Catholic, my mother was a Methodist, my brother was a Mormon and went to Baptist Bible school. She said, I have to ask you another question. What's that? Why did you leave the mother church? Oh. What does a brand new baby Adventist tell a Roman Catholic? Hmm. The beast! <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> I said, there are some things I found in Scripture that didn't agree with what I learned in catechism. And she said, like what? Well, the Bible says you should call no man father, except your father which is in heaven. She said, okay, what else? A priest can't say, ego te absolvo and forgive me my sins. Only Jesus can forgive me my sins. She said, what else? Well, I shared with her for another half hour. And she said, Paul, you have been so open and honest with me. It's my turn now to share with you. And I said, okay. Turns out she was visiting her sister for the Christmas holidays. She was from Europe, Italy, Vatican City. <laughs> Paul, I am the most powerful woman in all of Roman Catholicism. I serve on the National Council of Judaica at the Vatican, and I teach the Roman Catholic priest at the Gregorian Pontifical University. And I want to tell you something. You know God. The wisdom you have shared with me in this past hour is far beyond your young years to have acquired. You have had an encounter with the Almighty. I would love to take you back to the Vatican with me. I said, wait, I'm a Protestant. <laughs> and she says, no, I would like my priests to meet you. I want them to see what it looks like when someone has actually had an encounter with the Almighty God. Paul, you have found a very precious truth. Don't ever leave that. I can tell by your boldness and your excitement that God is going to put you on the front line and you have an exciting life ahead of you. Little did I know how prophetic her statement was. 
You see, according to my frequent flyer with Delta Airlines and Continental and American, I have already traveled 500,000 miles. And I'm not finished. She said, Paul, back at the Vatican, I call none of the Monsignor's father. I call them by their first name only. And when I kneel down at night, I too ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins because you're right. The priest does not have that authority. And I said, I don't understand. She said, listen carefully. You go out to those front lines and you do that work that God has called you to do. I'm going to have to work quietly behind the scenes for now, but I believe I can do more for the kingdom of God working quietly behind the scenes. But Paul, one day, I too will have to take my stand. And when I do, I'm going to join you. Now she's out there still waiting, along with the majority of God's people. You know what they're waiting for? They're waiting for you and I to fall so hopelessly, so helplessly in love with God that when they come in, they don't hear the gossip. They don't hear the criticizing. They don't see the compromises. They don't see the low standards. They see Jesus high and lifted up. And we're told when that remnant comes together and these pews are packed, half of us are going out. You know that, don't you? Brothers and sisters, that means you or the person sitting next to you right now this morning may be gone in the next couple of years, myself included, if we don't stay focused and filled with Jesus. Amen? Amen. I said, okay, Lord, no more testing. Boy, did you send me somebody from another church? Huh. He says, is that good enough for you, Paul? <laughs> Will the Vatican work? <laughs> Yes. People need to see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Galatians chapter 5. They need to see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. They need to see that. And when God knows they'll see it, they'll come in. They're waiting for you and I. Now, I've discovered in my travels, and Pastor Jobert, right here in McMinnville, you've got about four groups of Adventists. They're everywhere. I've been to 40 countries, five continents. They're everywhere. Four groups of Adventists. You've got Badvenist. You've got Madvenist. You've got Sadvenist. And then you have that little group called the Gladventist. They do have us outnumbered, but not outpowered. Amen. Because the Gladventists are the ones who have the Holy Spirit in their lives. Is that right? So how do you become a Gladventist? How do you stay a Gladventist? I found for myself three things were critical to be a Gladventist. Number one, daily devotional life. Time alone in this book. This book will keep you from sin. Sin will keep you from this book. Daily devotional life, the most critical factor. Number two, I needed to witness I needed to tell somebody what I got from this. Because if I don't share, I don't get any more. If I don't give, I don't get. I want more of that Holy Spirit. And if you're an open vessel, he comes pouring in like a flood. Third thing that was critical, what was the first one? Daily devotional life. Number two, witnessing. Number three, I needed to learn how to take care of this temple. This is sacred ground, as much as a sanctuary. And I had no idea how to take care of this body, mentally, physically, or spiritually. Let's talk about that for a few moments, since that's what we're going to be doing for the next three days. The motto of my program is to be healthy, happy, and holy for heaven, instead of sick, sad, and sinful with Satan. And I believe we can do that. And I can promise you, that if you'll attend all three meetings, you may never be the same person again. I have medical doctors attending my lecture that said they learned new things. Because this is coming straight from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. If it doesn't line up with that, I don't use it. It's got to line up with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, then it gets used. And you know what today? 
The medical world agrees with over 90% of what she said. You know, I started teaching this back in the 70s. It was not easy. Even Loma Linda didn't agree with some of the stuff she gave counsel to. They said, well, that was back, and that was this, and I'm going, that's what it says, that's what I'm doing. So we're catching up. Took us 6,000 years, but we just about caught up to God. Hmm. I know when I started practicing these principles, at first I thought, that can't be right. I grew up in a medical home. My mother was a nurse. I'm saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. But I kept studying, and I kept praying, and I realized, hmm, I needed to make some better choices. I wasn't making good choices at first. After I started making those good choices, my mother, the nurse, got upset. She said, son, you've eliminated two of the four food groups. And I said, no, mom, I've eliminated two of the toxic groups. She said, son, you've got to have meat and dairy products. And I said, no, I don't. I still have four food groups, fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables, Garden of Eden, that God gave us. And she goes, well, you just have a blood panel done every once in a while just to keep mom happy. So I used to have to do that every year. Blood panel sent directly from the clinic <laughs> with the doctor's signature. We'll share some of that with you in the seminar. <clears throat> After about 10 years of being a vegan, you guys know what a vegan is? We have these antenna that come out at 2 in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I don't need anything that goes to the bathroom. If it's got a face, if it's got a mama, I don't want it. If I have to chase it, I let it go. I never met an apple, carrot, or potato I couldn't get a hold of. <laughs> so after about 10 years of being a vegan, I was invited to England to speak at Oxford, Cambridge, and the University of London. When I got there, Enton Hall Medical Center found out about me. Now, Enton Hall is where the royalty of Europe go. Kings, queens, dukes, duchesses. It's run by Seventh-day Adventists. Very famous. And when they found out I was a vegan and I had arrived, they rang me on the telly. They said, Mr. Vogue, is that true? You've been a vegan for 10 years. And I said, yes. Oh, good. We'd like you to come down for some testing. And I said, why? Is it because we've never had a 10-year vegan? And we want to find out what you're on about. So you just put on your runners, some shorts, and we're going to hook you up to some electrodes and find out what you can do. So I went down there, got on the machine. Now, most of you know what these machines are. Every three minutes, these, uh, it looks like a, a treadmill, but every three minutes, they go faster. And every three minutes, they tip up higher and higher and higher. So this is the, the document, the result of that. I realize you can't see it from where you're sitting. Um, it says Enton Hall Medical Center. And on the bottom there, it says high category of fitness. And they said, uh, Mr. Vogt, it's impossible for you to have scored this high. Only the Olympic athletes can get this score. And I said, really? To score this well, you've got to train six or eight hours a day. You don't train that much. I said, no, I don't. To do this, you've got to be the best of the best. I said, well... And they said, well, quite frankly, you're too old. And I said, I'm too old? Yeah, somebody your age doesn't score this high. When I took this test, it's uh, right there, my age is written in. I was 35 years old. <laughs> I am now 65. Yeah, February, I became a senior citizen. But I'm siding with my Spanish friends. I'm a senior citizen, <laughs> Mr. Citizen. I don't feel like a senior citizen because you see you're as young as your attitude and your arteries. If your attitude is positive and constructive, you stay younger versus negative and destructive. And if your arteries are clear and open, these are the freeways that bring oxygen, fluid, nutrition, and remove the waste. And if they're clear and open, you get to stay younger longer. I started this when I was 23, never got out of my 20s. That's where I'm staying, and that's the truth. <laughs> Who wants to be in their 60s? <laughs> Third John 2 says very clearly, beloved I, would, uh, beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper, be in good health, 
even as your soul prospers. The Bible recognizes a very close relationship between your health and your soul. Did you catch that? There is a close relationship. God wants both of these to prosper. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've got problems here on planet Earth. We're on enemy territory, behind enemy lines. Anybody here have any bad habits? Nobody over here? If you don't, you got a bad habit of fibbing. <laughs> Anybody here have any junk food in your house? Yeah, I can do search and seizure if you're not sure. <laughs> Unless you're living in the garden, you might be in trouble. Yeah. Anybody here have any stress? You live in North America. It comes with the territory. Yeah. Dr. Hans Selye, the world's expert on stress, says if you will do three simple things, you can virtually eliminate all the stress in your life. Three simple things. You know what they are? I'm going to let you stress a little more. <laughs> but every one of them was biblical. He didn't even know it because he's not a Christian. But when I read his book, I said, this guy doesn't know this, but these are all biblical. Every one of them is biblical. So I'm going to show you from the Bible what the world's expert on stress figured out from all of his years of study and thousands of dollars of education, free in scripture. We got it. Be honest, how many of you wake up tired in the morning? Yeah, listen, I teach high school. I don't want first period class. They're not awake. They're wasted already, and they're teenagers. What's going to happen when they're 20 and 30? I'll tell you what's going to happen. They're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. Most people do wake up tired. That means there's something wrong. When you wake up, you should want to hit the floor running. Most people just hit the floor. And there's a reason why. If you wake up tired, your body is saying, the way you treated me yesterday and the day before, I can't do this again. And I'd just rather stay here. I'm exhausted. Everything you gave me, I had to fight. I didn't have any time to repair you. I didn't have any time to rejuvenate you because all of my energy was spending fighting what you were putting inside of me. We're going to find out what some of those things are. You may be in for a surprise. What you're putting in your body, you're wasting all of your time and energy and strength fighting what you're putting inside. Or you're not getting any exercise, not drinking enough water, not getting to bed on time. We're going to take a look at all of these. Do you have any friends who are fluffy, a little overweight? Please bring them here. We'll see less of them by next year. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, not a dead offering. Living. <laughs> Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual form of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. My friend, if you expect to be translated, you need to be transformed. Now, I know for many decades, the Adventist church has been preaching to people to be ready for the first resurrection. You know, we have another time now, and I don't think we just need to be preaching to be ready for the first resurrection. We need to be preaching to be ready for translation. That's different. That's different. And I don't preach for you to be in that first resurrection. This seminar and my preaching is to help you be ready for translation, not resurrection. Because I believe we're living in the time now we can actually be translated, not to see death, but that message is a high message. But that's what God wants for the final generation. You get a message, and you know what? I'm hearing it more and more, different preachers. They're not preaching for the first resurrection. They're preaching now a message for translation because it's time. The message for translation has to go out because this generation is to be ready for translation, not just resurrection. I want you to understand that when I teach these seminars, um, you're not going to eat your way to heaven, okay? You're not, even if it's angel food cake, you're not going to eat your way to heaven. However, I don't think devil's food cake is going to help any. Why do you think they call it devil's food? That should be a clue. Deviled eggs, deviled ham. Should be a clue. <laughs> but I want you to always remember, and I'll repeat this in the seminar, there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. There is nothing you can do to make God love you less. His love is not based on your performance. His love is based on who he is, love. And he loves you unconditionally. However, 
your performance, your response to that love will determine whether or not you'll be able to accept it and to live it. That's important. I believe the truth will set you free. You want to be free from diabetes? You want to be free from high blood pressure, high cholesterol? The truth will set you free. And as it says on your church motto, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you will follow his way, believe and accept his truth, you will have the life, both now and for eternity. I can see I'm over, so I'm going to have to move quickly now. In the seminar, I don't like to use fear, guilt, or shame. Well, maybe a little fear. <laughs> but I'm going to show you things that are good, I'm going to show you things that are better, and I'm going to show you things that are best. And then you get to decide how you want to feel. If you want to feel good, you'll try that. If you want to feel better, you can try some of that. And if you want what God wants best, you can do that. That's why I have a letter of recommendation from the General Conference. Dr. Floyd Brzee said this was the best presentation he had seen. Because he says you give people choice and you show them very simply. Don't use big words like trans fatty lipoproteins. <laughs> all right? I'm just going to tell you. Mayonnaise. All right? You'll get it. <laughs> Mm. Now, unfortunately, in my family, we had way too much junk food in our house. Part of the problem was my dad's profession. My dad was a cake decorator. <laughs> He's actually a very famous cake decorator. He decorated cakes for four American presidents. Here are two of his presidential cakes. On the top was President Eisenhower. That's my father decorating John F. Kennedy. He also did President Truman and Johnson. Every five years in Germany, they have what's called the World Culinary Olympics where the best chefs, ice carvers, cake decorators come to Germany to compete. And one year, my father won the gold medal right there, recognizing him as the number one cake decorator in the world. In 1976, when America celebrated her 200th birthday, the state of California commissioned my father to make the biggest birthday cake in the world for America's 200th birthday. And this 35,000 pound cake was what my dad made for the bicentennial. This cake was not in our house. <laughs> because had it been, my brother and I would have tried to eat it. That's where we got our bad eating habits. Hmm. After graduation, when we were in high school, my brother was a football player. Whoops, going ahead of myself. When we were in high school, my brother was a football player. But after graduation, he wasn't on the track anymore. He wasn't working out. Now, I did not play football. I was chasing the cheerleaders. I don't want 12 sweaty guys chasing me. <laughs> I stayed with the cheerleaders. That was much more pleasant. <laughs> His senior year, he was named All-State Tackle, number one tackle football player in the state of Alaska. If you were on the opposite team of my brother and he was coming at you, you better lay down and stay down or you're going to go down. Didn't mess with him. But graduation, no more workouts, no more track, no more glory. So why bother? But he kept eating the way he'd learned to eat as a teenager. You see, for some reason, when we turn 21, we don't click off the teenage button and become an adult. These teenagers continue to eat that food they learned to eat, which is one of the other reasons why I go into the high schools. In fact, Michelle Obama has asked us health educators to go clear down to third grade. That's where it's starting. But the problem is we need to talk to the ones who are buying the groceries, and it's not the third graders. So we have a problem. So, a number of years ago, I got a photograph of my brother and his wife, and each of them weigh over 600 pounds. About eight years ago, she died of a massive heart attack. She will never see another sunset. She will never smell another rose. She will never hear my brother say those words, I love you, because what she chose for pleasure destroyed her. I don't want you to make those choices. And for the next three days, we can help you stop making those choices. Proverbs 13, 17 says, a faithful ambassador brings healing. I want to be that faithful ambassador to you. I want to bring healing into your life, mentally, physically, and spiritually. It's so important. Now, I told you the devotional life was the key factor. Okay, Because without God in your life, you're going to have a difficult time practicing good health principles. You'll make New Year's resolutions every year. 
and they're usually done by Valentine's Day. We break them, and then they break us. I believe the devotional life is so important, it's actually one of the Ten Commandments. That's how important it is. And God, being a God of order, would make number one the most important. And what does number one say? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If I get up in the morning, you'd rather watch Good Morning America instead of Good Morning Jesus. What may be my God? Could be that TV set. If I would rather read the bad news in the newspaper instead of the good news in the Bible, what may be my God? Could be that newspaper. Now, I'm not saying there's necessarily anything wrong with television and newspaper. I see it myself sometimes. But if it prevents me from spending time with God, there is something wrong. I have broken that first commandment, haven't I? And you know what you're going to discover, as I did? Every time you break that first commandment, the next nine will come crashing down on you all day long. That's why God made the first commandment first. Because if you would keep that, have no other gods before him, make him first in your life, you have now given him permission and authority to carry you through the next nine commandments. But if you break that first commandment, the next nine will break you. Keep that first commandment. It will pray for you. When your pastor, Gilbert, and I made the appointment to have this seminar here, as soon as I book a church, I begin to pray for them. So I've been praying for you guys for some time now, and I get to see you. First time. Here you are. I've been praying for you all this time, and now you're here. I didn't know anybody in this church. First time here, and I'm so grateful that we have this divine appointment together. Now, the reason that I'm here in McMinnville is because of these vows that I made to God. That's right. Specifically, number nine. Number nine of my vows states, I believe in the soon coming of Jesus as the blessed hope. And it is my settled determination to prepare to meet him in peace, as well as to help others to get ready for that glorious appearing. I'm determined to meet my God in peace. And if you will allow me the privilege and the honor, I am just as determined to help you get ready for that glorious appearing as well. Our closing song, 462, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. I can see we're already at 1230, so we'll just sing the first verse. <laughs> Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. By the way, these are our four topics for tonight. We're going to have wars, wars right here in the sanctuary. Water, air, rest, and sunshine. Four topics for tonight. 462, Blessed Assurance. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you constantly come into our lives to encourage us and to strengthen us. And Lord, this weekend, we have the opportunity to learn more how to be healthy, happy, and holy for heaven. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <laughs>